Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's performance will include shamanistic totems, shaming Christianity, and a Reagan-era dog that might be selling drugs to children? All this and more as we discuss Smokey Bear on Created Things. Howdy there, campers, and welcome to Created Things, the only arts podcast hosted by two bros who are totally fire, but in kind of a dangerous and problematic way. Uh, with me is my good and excellent friend, Father Gabriel Toretta. I, of course, am Jacob Flores Popchik, artist and psychotherapist. How you doing, Father? Well, you know, um, I'm not really going to say flaming uh because i just that's <laughs> no, you're always flaming Come that's on. just you're a flaming bear These, wow there's, there's, this we, is we this, i like how this make. started bad there and just it got way worse puns there's too many puns not to make <laughs> it's so true we're just it's doing true. This. so i'm just gonna jump headlong into this because i'm too excited not to um so father gabriel and i um we recorded for fourth of july a and if you've not listened to it you should check it out but we recorded uh, an episode for fourth of july um on the subject of sort of like government sponsored art right the, these weird things that happen when the government gets involved and says hey we really want to use art to uh propagate a certain message and that prompted a conversation between us off air about the hilarity of government sponsored mascots like characters designed agendedly uh, for children on behalf of the government to represent a very specific uh, uh, sort of moralistic message until three minutes ago, we were going to do an episode just about that. We were going to talk about McGruff, the crime dog. We were going to talk about Japanese mascots. We're going to talk all kinds of cool stuff. And then we both realized how much we just, really wanted to talk about Smokey the Bear. I spent that, I, like, I was actually, actually, like, I did like hours of research today on Smokey the Bear because I which I was not intending to do. I was I was just looking for other mass things to, to talk about with mascots. Uh and well, I and I have done a lifetime of research on Smokey the Bear. Evidenced by the fact that if you guys are watching the video version of the podcast, I'm currently wearing Again, thinking that we were just doing an episode about mascots generally, government sponsored mascots generally, I am wearing this um, Smokey the Bear, officially licensed Smokey the Bear t shirt here. Sexy. And I am wearing, uh, uh, I'm not wearing, I am drinking out of this officially licensed Smokey the Bear mug featuring the official seal and also the new Smokey the Bear message, which we'll get into. Only you can keep forests green. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Hello. So that doesn't have a future. I'll tell you that right now. (laughs) So we, uh, yeah, we did a abrupt last minute pivot and this is now, uh, this is now a Smokey the Bear fan account. Yeah. So, so it, uh, yeah. So hashtag smoke that bear. Um, it's uh, one of the one of the first and surprising thing I learned uh, in exploring the wild uh, and woolly world that is Smokey the Bear is that his name is not actually Smokey the Bear. My entire wow. life, all yes. all I've ever heard in my own head and then other people refer to him is uh is with the um the honorific definite article you know um mm-hmm. like winnie if, the pooh yeah. like winnie the pooh john the baptist gabriel the sexy you know like people say these things um <laughs> because it's like this is the apex of what it means to be this thing you know and i just thought well is smoky the bear uh however his name turns out to actually just be smoke a burr um yeah just smoky bear just smoky bear like my whole life is my whole what i'm i'm not saying jacob my whole life is a lie i'm just saying my whole life is a lie (laughs) that's what i'm saying that's what i'm saying although it's not completely false because there have been even like um smoky bear as i'm trying this out for the first time uh Smokey Bear is a tightly controlled 
uh, brand with tightly controlled uh, uh, targeting slogans and and uh, and all the rest, which is great. Um, but even he has had slips uh, in his long history. And um, one of these slips is that uh, in 1966, there was a feature film made about him um as one do um when when one makes a mascot that is so insanely successful that you can actually make it have its own prime time like aired t- movie you know you've really made it and they called that the ballad of smoky the bear which is a whole different yes thing. well this is where the confusion happens is because smoky very early on in his history gets a theme song that actually did make it to like the top 10 of the charts um when it came out in like the 40s or 50s or whenever the hell and and they in order to kind of keep the meter say smoky the bear and this was the ballad of smoky the bear that's the song oh um, this and, is why this is oh and my so this gosh. is the confusion his everything. name is smoky bear but the song needed to be the, the because bear. they just it just Instead flowed just being better. Smoky yeah. bear, which they could have done too mm-hmm. if they had the courage. Um, um, or Smoky the B the B R, which if they had had more courage. Um, or if they had just spoken in Japanese, you know, Kuma no Smoky, and then we would have really just like solved the whole problem. You know, I feel like. Um, Anyway, I feel like we would just solve a lot of problems. We would just like I randomly slipped into speaking Japanese. But uh, let's talk about let's talk about Smokey Bear. Where do you want to start? I would like to very much. Um, well, I want to. I so his wild origin maybe, story. No, I asked you. You tell me what you want. Wild origin story would be great. His <clears throat> his insanely reverent tomb would be great. Um, Maybe we should just talk. So again, I mean, I sort of until three minutes ago, Thar, five minutes ago, now thought that we were going to do a government sponsored mascot thing. So maybe it makes the most sense to kind of go in via the intro of just why anyone would want to do this and why anyone would say, hey, like we need to target political activism at children by way of a cartoon character because that in and of itself is like kind of a bizarre idea right and i know that we're not going to do the full mascot thing now but like kids famously can't vote kids famously can't do a lot to actually prevent in Smokey's case forest fires they can't even like buy I did all the this alcohol research. or the cigarettes that are the primary together the primary cause of forest fires well per the alcohol and cigarettes thing i mean you know mcgruff the crime dog Smokey's angry fascist cousin is like literally built a career off of just telling like very very young children someday you'll be old enough to get high on crack when that happens don't Don't like just the idea of inventing a character to aim a very not child appropriate thing at children is kind of just a fascinating thing right from the very beginning yeah it is it is a trip and i think Part of what's wild about, okay, because there are these species, right? Because like McGruff, the crime fighting dog, um, was obviously designed um, to get young kids interested in experimenting with drugs. Um, or I should say, <laughs> this is what happened, like literally, right. like this is incredible. Like, there's so much data on like the DARE program and it turned out like this is literally what happened. It's that like, mm-hmm. it just educated like sheltered eight year olds like me, uh, to like, did you know there's these crazy substances that will get you so wild and high and it's real bad though, kids. Yeah. Don't do They're it. so bad. Don't they will get you so it. high that if Man, you ever do crazy. it, you're going to want on- on any street in america you could go to like right now you could go to 51st and cherry and you could talk to a guy named rufus and he would s- sell you that sweet gaju gaju and it will make your head explode be so bad. and all you have to do is say richie sent you uh but don't do but that don't do so bad and like you might be a, you might be like a sheltered eight-year-old from spokane washington and so you probably think that the only <laughs> word for drugs is like marijuana but let me tell you those other words like 
bath salts and pudding pops and okay i don't know what else <laughs> anyway uh, yeah so it turns out that mcgruff the crime fighting dog uh was legitimately targeted at children and legitimately got them hooked on crack um which is like what are you gonna do the funny thing about Smokey is that he's not exactly targeted at children. Um, He's part of the like broad scope of mascots or anthropomorphic um, totem. I mean, he's he's, I don't want to put it this way. He's basically a totem. He's an American totem. You know, like he's God, you're right. He is literally like a totemic God, yeah like he's like Smokey the bear he's not he's not actually a mascot and it, the, the, it depends how you define mascot wait, wait, i am now completely hoarse because i was imagining when you said spoken at washington for some reason i had an image of a child version of you but still with your full beard oh yeah just watching like a psa about crack and going oh i should maybe do that and the, just the image of like a fully bearded child <laughs> made me la- made me choke on my tea that i'm drinking out of my official license smoking bear mug and now i'm wrecked for the rest of this episode <laughs> but it's gonna but be yeah, a shit, very- you're right like anthropologically smoky bear is he's a like, if you're just looking at it yeah sort of in terms of world spirituality and anthropology and things he's a totemic like like animal spirit guide yeah kind of a creature yeah. like like shamanistic yeah creature yeah he totally I is i love this he totally is it's amazing um and it is funny because like mascots in some ways sort of like physically represent the thing that they're that they're supposed to be um there you know so like um mm-hmm. so so mcgruff the crime fighting dog is the police which you keep saying right? you see you keep adding fighting the same way that you keep adding the to smoky it's just mcgruff the crime dog wait which is what then, wait I a second so you're saying that his plan to get kids hooked on crack was actually the goal from the beginning because he's a yeah. freaking crime and, dog nobody he noticed that nancy, he wasn't a crime fighter he was just a crime right. dog yeah least of all nancy reagan who produced an album with him that i'm definitely going to talk about in this episode he's uh, literally just, just a me. crime dog and nobody noticed yeah. nobody thought to do no studies like is it's Smokey Bear and McGruff, oh the very explicitly dog devoted to crime. That's yeah. incredible. <laughs> I love everything about that. Okay, so yeah, so he is. Li- he's apparently. I thought he. I thought he was a symbol of the police, but apparently he's a symbol of organized crime. Um, which is fine. Uh, but Smokey Bear isn't right. Like he's a uh, the like the the U.S. Forest Service calls him like a fire prevention bear. Right. You know, yeah, as as one does, you know, like so he's so he's legit, like, as you say, anthropologically speaking, he's a totem, which is cool. Well, and honestly, just I I mean, the idea of mascot as like minor genius or minor deity, like like the ancient Romans have this idea of like the the is it genius loci? Is that is that the, the right genius of the place? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like a minor D, but I'm getting that word, that term, right? Genius loci. I think that's that's the right term. Like, uh, so you have like a minor sort of. It's wrong to even call it a deity because we have all these sort of Judeo-Christian trappings associated with that in the modern world. But like, essentially, like a minor spirit or a minor fairy uh, would maybe be a better. But but basically, they're they're a a a spirit world creature that embodies and ultimately protects and bestows the given thing. So you'll have one for the crossroads, you'll have one for the town, you'll have one for the for the kitchen, right? And I I never kind of thought of mascots, even sports mascots and things like this, as a as sort of a, a an anthropological continuation of that idea, just through sort of the the lens of capitalism rather than religion but like that is actually what we're talking about here yeah which I, yeah i think that's, that's i think that's fair there's um like the japanese have an have an idea of uh like like coming these um spirits that like adhere in in uh things and places especially natural things um uh, you know trees especially big beautiful trees or um stones these kinds of things um uh and they uh 
they can work to more powerful ones can work to protect the places where they are and these kinds of things and others just are sort of there or whatever um smoky bear really is a kind of a cummy figure here um i mean people will make these kinds of arguments actually specifically about um mascots and these things and and uh they'll, they, they'll draw these i mean completely specious in terms of explicit historical genealogy these completely specious um uh genealogies from like uh japanese kami worship and you know so-called shinto and stuff like this to like japanese obsession with ma- with mascots and stuff like this but which I, so it's a false genealogy but um anthropologically speaking there is this interesting thing about this this idea like the heart has some idea about like particularly like something that i'm very attached to i it's sort of my own attachment forms a kind of a spiritual sense and i feel like there's something about this that like i want to reverence or protect and that guys that, that can be kind of mirrored in a kind of sense of its spiritual life or whatever and like in smoky bear kind of becomes this you know or like plays off of this or in or creates it or whatever for the for like the experience of particularly american wilderness which like again america's love of the wilderness is not an ancient idea it's kind of a 19th century late late 19th century idea um of like yeah, loving. as america was sort of you say again because you referenced it in an episode like three episodes ago but for us that feels like like five minutes ago in conversation but yeah like america was sort of trying to reverse engineer hey what is our cultural identity outside of just european trappings and one of the things they really really attached themselves to especially kind of like post jeffersonian writings and stuff like this was the idea of the megafauna and and you know the wilderness and all this sort of thing so this was this was like a reverse engineered american cultural identity yeah and like and it's just and there is also yeah and then they say and then you think like well what is america a lot a lot of well it's got a lot of like a what we have a lot of that like western europe doesn't gigantic untouched expanses of forest and these kinds of things and like big ass cliffs etc 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 so like, anyway so that's not like a super ancient vintage and like park service and like the notion of camping and stuff as like a pleasure thing that like families would do and stuff like this is all kind of this is all pretty new and growing over the course of the 20th like early 20th century well, i mean the country is pretty new and growing i mean like that's that's what you also have to have to consider like you know so so smoky bear for me falls into i was obs- i said i did a lifetime of research on this and i mean it like i was obsessed with smoky bear at a very young age because i was obsessed with americana folklore at a very early age oh, so like sure. paul bunyan and john henry and pecos bill and Brer rabbit and all these kinds of things and Smokey is kind of a a 20th century add-on to that but people will be very kind of snobbish in academic circles about figures like paul bunyan and they'll refer to them as fake lore right because oh, they're not sure. actual folklore they are often propagated by a company like i think Paul Bunyan is actually like advanced by, I think a molasses brand or a pancake brand or something at one point. Um, or, you know, and definitely like lumber unions take him on as a mascot and things like this. And so the, the sort of snobbish academic argument is, well, they're not real folklore because they don't primarily, uh, these characters don't primarily emerge as a result of like campfire story traditions but i think that's a really snobbish viewpoint because america is just not old enough to have a to have a a long-term folkloric uh trend like that i mean european america anyway i mean obviously i'm not talking about indigenous america here right i'm talking about you know european american culture um and and i think insofar as it's possible for us to have folkloric characters guys like Paul Bunyan and stuff are definitely authentic versions of this. But I mean, just on the wilderness thing, I mean, I, I'm, uh, you know, I mentioned the Jeffersonian idea, right. And, and Jefferson like very early on is fighting to create an authentically American identity um, in response to a European idea that like everything in America is smaller and weaker and grayer and sad. Mm. Um, and so, uh, there's, I forget the name of the guy, but there's a very famous at the time, French scientist who is trying to, to really popularize this idea that, um, that everything in America is like, Hey, their bears are smaller 
than our bears and their trees are smaller than our trees and their weather is wetter than here. And, and it's because the climate there sucks. And so even the people there are weaker uh, and, and they can't possibly compete with us amazing European elites. And so Jefferson ends up funding the Lewis and Clark mission uh, basically in the hopes of proving that mammoths and megatherium that is giant sloths are still very much alive on the West coast because oh he's hoping to kind of prove the, uh, the megafauna theory. This is primarily the reason that he's, he's doing this. Um, the Northwest passage is very secondary to him. But one of the other things he does to disprove this myth that keeps him up at night is he has a moose killed um, with the intention of having it mailed to that French scientist. Oh, to prove so good. That American megafauna are still very much a thing, except the taxidermy process goes horribly wrong and they end up attaching the wrong antlers to the animal. And so, and then it gets lost in the mail. Mm, and so six sad. months after being sent, this poor French scientist receives the rotting stinking corpse of a moose left on his doorstep with a tag reading from American president Thomas Jefferson. Oh my gosh. I don't really <laughs> like Thomas Jefferson, but I love that. There's so not a hard. lot to like. There's but, not a lot that to, is like easy about to like about a guy who said That's all men are created like. equal except my secret slave wife. Um, except that, that is, you know, that is, but the moose thing that, easy to delight. There's in. so much to love about that. That's amazing. <laughs> Right. And so, I mean, you know, you're right that, I mean, you're right in a sense, I think that the sort of wilderness aesthetic of America, um, is a, is a newer one, but I would argue that's mostly because America is a newer place. I mean, many of the guys who found the country are, are really trying to push this as a fundamental characteristic of our identity pretty early on. I mean, I think it was John Quincy Adams who said the art of making love in the cold on a bed of furs is a distinctively Yankee invention. Oh, um, like this well, I guess is I can't like argue a thing he wrote. Yeah. Right. So, so like these guys are, are very much trying to brand America as this. And I think Smokey bear to make a very short story long Smokey bear is a direct totemic outcome of this american love affair however self-created it might be on with a, our unique idea of what wilderness is on its bed of furs right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so like okay okay i take that and so then like in the like teens 20s 30s uh and 40s you're getting this like now r sense of like recreation in the wilderness that you take your family and you like go hiking like into the woods and you set up a camp and you like hang out there and you hike mm -hmm. there for a week and then that's your like family vacation for the for the year or right. whatever like we've civilized nature enough at this point that now it's fun and safe to kind of return to it instead of needing to prove my dominion over it yeah exactly and yeah. like the park service is getting started and stop and what turns out to be happening when this goes on is that like a bunch of it burns down like every year like insane quantities burns down every year and like mm -hmm. yeah it's a lot more of it's burning down every year than had happened before the kind of boom in like, hey, guys, let's go. Let's go hiking in our in our new like national parks and stuff. Um, uh, so it seems reasonable to say that, like, yeah, these are these are like man made forest fires, you know, from like yes. preventable things like whatever. Um, uh, <laughs> throwing away matches and then things like that. Um, so, OK, and also, right. Um now we're gonna we're, now we're jumping into like the early mid 40s and it's also in the middle of world war ii so this is another cultural force that's happening it's like it's also part of world war ii um and wood like everything um is a part of the war effort it's um if for various reasons i mean it's, it's both used militarily um like overseas um so it's shipped and used mil uh, militarily overseas uh and then also like because the whole country is militarized like everything in the country is is part of the war effort and so uh there's there there's like a twofold campaign that's the same thing which is like we got to reduce all these forest fires um partly just because like also we could like now we have this new 
love of the forest as like protected wilderness and so we don't want to burn it down by like i'm guys i'm so glad that you want to hike now that's so cool could you burn down a little bit less of it that would be really really great so that's one which is cool but then the other is also this is a part of a war effort and so like be patriotic um and like i don't burn down the forest because like uncle sam needs that wood to like kill the germans and like uh you know take care (laughs) of the japanese yeah 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 yeah. no but i mean but there are but there are a ton of like 1941 1942 1943 um uh government sponsored advertisements that are exactly this so it'll be like a like a haunted looking man sort of like um digging in the forest uh, that's all ablaze around him and it says like you know like support the country fight forest fires you know and it's like it's all of this about how this is part of the war effort you know um so in like by 1944 um other forces try to get involved and one of them is actually your boy disney yeah a a uh, a patriot to a fault let's say yeah so he so he um he submits um for free ish question mark um a a campaign like a poster campaign that gets used uh and is actually quite popular um that shows bambi and some mm-hmm. friends right and it says please mister don't be careless you know because it's like don't be careless. i like the voice i like the voice i also like this is a weird uh, dynamic shift, but I, I like you saying he did it for free. Uh, normally, where, where, that is a nice way, uh, listeners, uh, gentle listener. That is a nice way of saying he didn't exchange for not sending the animators he liked to the battlefront. To, yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, that's that's all this. too happy to send the animators who tried to unionize against him to the battlefront. They actively provided a list of names of people who were trying to unionize as communist sympathizers who should definitely be sent to the front of the battle, like King David sending the wife of Bathsheba. But uh, I think that the ended well, liked, though, right? Like that was good in yeah. the Bible. Like that was a good thing. Yeah, God wasn't upset about it. Not at all. Yeah, he was Um, like, bro, thanks for, you know, doing some work for me. I appreciate that. Yeah. 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 So so definitely in sort of a modern Americana way, Walt Disney says, the animators I like should definitely stay here and draw Bambi for the government. Yeah, exactly. So they they do. And the campaign, like, goes pretty well, except the problem is that, like, a kid's, and this is what I, the, the thing with Smokey Bear is, like, kids really liked the Bambi thing. The, like, please, mister, don't be careless. Um... Adults hated it because if you look at it, I mean, just like picture in your mind, Bambi, it looks exactly like Bambi because it was drawn by those exact same people or the ones who didn't get murdered uh, by being sent uh, to die in Western Europe. Um, And uh, uh, it's drawn by those people. It looks exactly like that. Please, Mr. Don't be careless. If you're an adult and you're looking at that, it kind of suggests visually like America is a very small prey animal about to be casually murdered. This is this is ac- okay. So this is actually a fascinating thing about mascots, right? And and especially about American mascots, where so America's whole brand, and this is definitely invented. And I think we are increasingly culturally becoming aware of the fact that this is invented and by no means organic or real. But from the very beginning of the American identity was this idea of we are the underdog, right? We want to always believe that we're the underdog and we want to always support the underdog. Even if we are absolutely not the underdog, we need to come up with some sort of backwards logic as to why we are in order to justify our doing this terrible thing that we want to do. I mean, this is like the fundamental highest virtue of the American identity is being an underdog. And you can totally still see it in social, you know, politics and culture wars now, and it goes all the way back to the, the origins. But the problem with being the underdog is it does actually contrast in a not entirely delightful way with the other distinctively American desire, which is to be seen as uh, manly let's say in sort of a, a toxic kind of neoclassical sense. Right. And so 
Um, you see this a lot um, in the in in the same period with uh, Marvel and DC superheroes. This mm. is this is why Batman continues to be at that time and now a bigger sell than Superman. You can't you can sell Superman as all powerful and all American, but he's very very hard to sell as an underdog because he is all mm. powerful. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. But you can sell Batman. You can sell Spider Man. Right. These guys are powerful, but not powerful enough to not be the underdog. Bambi is the underdog, but he is definitely not powerful enough. So he makes me feel too weak. And so we need to find something who can function as the underdog, but also makes me feel manly. And that's a difficult niche to hit. It's a real niche. And so like, uh, so this like, uh, it's government sponsored, although um, this part of the story is probably too long to tell, but it's very complexly uh, bound up with the way in which um, in brief uh, the 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 Great Depression completely shatters the at that point still quite new advertising industry. Um, and uh, the very little bit of credibility that advertising had managed to build up um, is completely obliterated by the Great Depression. Um, the industry is like on the verge of collapse. Um, there's like so much distrust of uh, of this whole thing, which again is actually still quite new at the time. Uh, and so quite seriously, like a bunch of ad commissions um, and government agencies team up together um, to... Um, create kinds of messaging to reach people that will achieve both of their goals at once. It will help people trust advertising agencies again, and it will help people trust the government. Um, or well, will- and and in all defense to, I mean, not that he needs anyone to defend him, but in all due defense to Walt Disney, I mean, this is exactly the same thing that's happening there, right? I mean, the studio is absolutely going to be shut down by the government. There is not enough money going in animation. No one wants to see movies. No one wants to, and Walt Disney basically to keep the guys to keep his guys employed goes and beseeches them like, please, please, please give us small amounts of money and we will create propaganda films for you in exchange for you. Just like letting a certain number of us not have to go to war. Um, yeah. and, and so basically all artists, whether they are advertising artists, whether they are animation artists, whether they're painters are desperately trying to convince the government that their particular art form is worthy of subsidizing yeah. and definitely not sending them to war for. Uh, and this is just kind of a universal experience and, and a collective trauma for all artists at this time. Yeah. 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 No, that's a, yeah, exactly. So out of this emerges, um, on August 9th, 1944, Smokey bear, Smokey the bear. Smokey bear. And I want to get into why Smokey was so successful, but, uh, we are talking about underdogs. We are talking about supporting the little artist, lest he have to go to war. And that is a perfect segue into, uh, this brief shout out to our sponsor, uh, Catholic creatives and Catholic dot store, uh, for its part, Catholic creatives is an organization that seeks to unite, uh, artists and makers and artisans and all that good stuff from across kind of the faith community, uh, for major events and, and, uh, you know, summits and, um, different kind of support, uh, enrichment activities, initiatives. Uh, and to do that, they actually need your support, quite frankly, Father Gabriel and I need your support to continue doing this podcast. Uh, and so to support those initiatives, initiatives like this show and, and, and like the others I've mentioned, uh, we would ask you to consider visiting um, and supporting our Patreon via catholiccreatives.org forward slash support. Uh, and if you want to go the extra mile to support those little artists so that they don't have to, to go off and kill the Kaiser, uh, do consider stopping by um, catholic.store. Not catholicstore.com or any of that crap catholic.store uh, where you can give money directly to to little local artisans uh, doing their part to make the world a more beautiful place so check out uh, so oh I'm gonna I'm gonna do this in the style of an American uh, propaganda PSA to, to do your part and be a patriot go to Catholic creatives forward slash support and catholic.store today today. <laughs> so yeah so Smokey the bear is invented by an advertising company except kind of also god then gets involved yeah because the character happens 
but isn't really taken off. He's just another character. And there's no built-in brand recognition the way there is for Bambi. So why would everybody love this character? Meanwhile, in my wife's home state of New Mexico, uh, one of these forest fires that you mentioned breaks out and leaves a little black bear cub orphaned. Um, he climbs mm. a tree and his little mm. paws are pretty badly burned. Mm. And a U.S. airman stationed there, I believe it's an airman, I think, uh, yeah, because I, I, I have a very distinct memory of seeing um, seeing like Air Force planes uh, in association with Smokey. And they, this U.S. airman um, finds Smokey, rescues him, and takes him as sort of a platoon mascot and feeds him and nurses him back to health and the office that creates smoky goes holy shit holy shit holy shit this is perfect we please, have a please, literal please smoky bear yeah name him smoky we now have a real or we they didn't have an origin story for the character he was just a bear who wore a ranger hat and told people not to and like pants. forest fires and pants well Sometimes, uh, and uh, you know, he's telling people to not light forest fires. But now he's got this tragic origin story, and they uh, and they agree. And oh my god, the photos! Like we'll 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 put some in this episode for those of you watching the video version. They'll they'll be kind of phasing by right now. Um, but if you're not listening to the, or watching the video version of this podcast, do yourself a favor and look up photos of this bear. It's the cutest thing in the world. I mean, bar none, totally sincerely. So, so freaking cute. And if you go to the smoky bear museum, as I have in New Mexico, um, I made a pilgrimage. I drove three and a half hours, literally just to go there and then turn around and go back. Um, but there's more to do there. I didn't realize until I got there, uh, like three doors down is where Billy the Kid was assassinated. So there's a whole By cowboy Smokey the town bear? and stuff. Yeah, Smokey the Bear killed. Oh my gosh, he's Billy a stone the Kid, man. We're it gonna, is, dude, oh man, is, we're gonna blow this shit wide open. He man. was the framed. CIA does by, he was you framed know, by McGrath the Crime Dog, bro. Like, <laughs> see, okay, that shit I would believe. No, um, yeah, you make a day trip, go see the Billy the Kid Museum, and then go to the. Uh, Smoky Bear Museum, like five minutes down the road. But anyway, if you go to that museum, as I have, you will see the bespoke little leather harness that they made for Will Smokey <laughs> so they could take him on walks and feed him marshmallows. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so freaking cute. I mean, truly, like, I'm not kidding. It's adorable. And it's a national treasure in and of itself. Um, and, you know, if you're a history fan, if you're a fan of Americana, 99.9% .9 of the time, any of the romantic stories you want to believe about America turn out to have a very cynical dark side. Um, you know, Paul Revere kids, he, uh, he stopped the midnight ride about a fifth away through and got drunk and left it to a teenage girl to finish. Um, uh, you know, that doesn't sound that bad to me. <laughs> um benjamin franklin you know he didn't he didn't tie a, uh, a key to a kite and uh put it out to discover electricity no he already knew lightning it could be, could kill people so he sent his very young son son outside to do it while he watched from the safety of the porch uh generally speaking american history is actually terrible uh and the most romantic parts of it that is especially the case for thank christ that isn't the case for the Smokey Bear story. It is actually cute all the way along because what? Smokey Bear gets when he becomes too big for the U.S. airmen who rescued him to take care of him. They build him what was considered at the time and is honestly still considered to be the most humane and elaborate uh, zoo exhibit in existence in uh, certainly in america uh it was far afield from the iron bar cages that were most uh ubiquitous at the time uh they build in this beautiful stone enclosure at the dc zoo um they ship him there uh when he gets old enough they get him a mrs smoky um he fathers i think Smoke three or cats. four little cubs smoky jr uh and is officially a state employee. He is actually a considered 
like an employee of the government and receives like a government pension and is protected as such, uh, which means that when he turns, what's the official cutoff age? Uh, for government employees is 65 65? or something i'm not sure when he gets that old in bare years he is allowed to retire and they build him another exhibit on a little um what's it called like a wildlife refuge or whatever back in new mexico they ship him there he lives out the last of his days there when he dies of purely natural causes, extremely comfortable, not abused at all. When he dies, they build him a tomb with the boulder that was found, like where he was found in the forest fire. They build, they cart this gigantic boulder. They carve an epitaph into it for him. They bury him under his, and this is where the Smokey Bear Museum is now. It is actually a functional tomb to Smokey Bear. And Quite beautifully, um, it is also a memorial to uh, firefighters who have lost their lives fighting forest fires and whose bodies were never recovered. And so the Smoky Bear Museum is actually also a national memorial to those people. Um, and so you can visit the final resting of this actual bear who is buried there like a national hero, as well as these these human heroes. So it's, it's one of those rare, uh, sweet spots in American folklore that is actually nice all the way through. Like, not this is actually kind terrible of and racist. It's both sweet and like a cool marketing ploy and also like really cool way of honoring these like men who give their lives in like really amazing ways. Um, that and isn't never- that at the end of the day? what america is all about it's kind of a sweet marketing ploy that can sometimes be cynical but sometimes it's actually really beautiful at the same time (laughs) that's uh this is a really amazing uh historian of america called walter mcdougall who has this basic thesis that like america is a nation of hustlers uh totally yeah and he uses the he uses the term um uh neutrally morally neutrally you could say just like yeah just hustlers just just cut mm-hmm. nation of hustlers you know and this is this is like hustling smoky smoky bear like nobody's business you know um well it's this phenomenon that you and i keep finding ways to organically come to in this podcast which is this i this phenomenon of velveteen rabbiting right where where you know we've talked about it in a lot of different contexts where an art form pretends to be something and then over time by being loved enough actually becomes that. So again, you know, examples include in our Christmas kitsch episode, we talked about the generic mass produced baby's first ornament, uh, you know, or baby's first Christmas ornament, you know, which is absolutely nothing special, uh, but sort of pretends to be kind of an important art thing becomes this extremely sacred totem within a family's life cycle because it represents their particular unique baby. We've talked about towns that do this, right. That, that, you know, Honestly, to go to to New Mexico again, where you know the birthplace is Smoky, uh, Santa Fe, you know, is this beautiful, beautiful town that ostensibly looks to be this very ancient, you know, amalgamation of European, indigenous, and Mexican architectures. Uh, only it wasn't; it was absolutely invented wholesale or wholesale from whole cloth uh, by people who wanted it to look that way. But has since subsequently become this very, very beautiful. Um, culture, it's become exactly what it portends to be, right? And and Smokey is kind of one of the more sincere versions of that too, right? Where sometimes the hustler or the hustle hustles so well that it becomes real. And and maybe the most profound version of that is we invent a character and then the real bear actually uh, uh, incarnates, as it were, wow. and we, we uh, you know, we build a, a totem and a, and a shamanistic uh, genius loci um, out of him. And it's amazing within that because like as I mean, with all of that, the animated drawn smoky never stops being smoky. Right. So they never right. there's in the end, you get these kind of two tracks because like if you can visit the National Zoo or if you're around, you know, um, New Mexico when he's in New Mexico. You can see like, oh, this is Smokey the Bear. But at the same time, everyone actually knows that Smokey Bear is the drawing. You know, Smokey Bear is <coughs> the anthropomorphic creature with the ranger hat and the dungarees that says like, um, only you can prevent forest fires. Um, right. Which is the sort of dissonance of childhood magic, right? Because, I mean, 
mall Santa does not look anything like what most kids imagine Santa Claus to look like, but we uh, ascribe the same affection to both as, as being one single human, um, Mickey mouse, you know, to go back to our good, uh, Davidic pal, Walt Disney. (laughs) Right. I mean, like the mascot costume you meet as you and I recently met at Walt Disney world looks very little like any version of the cartoon character. Um, but they are the same, Yeah, you know, any any kid who meets them, it's like, no, no, there that's Mickey. It's just Mickey in three dimensions looks like this and Mickey on my TV looks like this. And they are the same person. Um, and if that's not, I mean, if that's not a shamanistic totem, I don't know what is right. Because it's, it's a creature that can essentially change forms, but is, uh, is nevertheless the same central being at its core. We're sort of reverse engineering Neil Gaiman's American gods in this episode, aren't we? Uh, yeah, to... maybe possibly so. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe we kind of I just realized what art. we were doing. <laughs> so listen, it happens that way. But um but there there is so one aspect of the whole Smokey Bear story is pre- precisely um the frankly unexpected way in which um the real Smokey is the Smokey who lives in our hearts? You know, this it's is the uh, friends we made along the way. Yeah. It's the real Smokey is the friend that we made along the way, uh, because like this is not the horizon of success that was originally planned, right? The horizon of success originally planned is like um, work ad agencies and the government working together to like um, w- get. Uh, kind of unite the American people in the in the kind of great war effort cultural project uh, kind of thing um, like the sort of New Deal America that's kind of that's kind of coming into into invention um, and everything everything with all of that um, and like what's going to come after that who knows but with this interesting character and like the physical characteristics of Smokey that get settled pretty quickly on um, is anthropomorphic character like the it's a it's a modified bear body um, like he's I mean it, it is an interesting thing if you look at like sort of decade by decade or even like five years by five years because there's ends up being a bunch of different smoky designs um, uh, his amount of obvious buffness and then dad bodness changes like it, it it sort of keeps fluctuating so like some representations yeah. of smoky he's got a he's got a um uh a sizable like pot belly um mm-hmm. and he'll have strong bear arms but like bears are kind of fun because they're like adorably fat kind of you know um so sometimes you'll have this kind of like pot belly and look like this sort of like buff dad bod guy other times he just looks kind of like jacked um like right and and the most of the three-dimensional versions um including the the so so smoky receives more fan mail than any celebrity of his time yeah bro Uh, smoky has his own zip code right smoky has his own zip code and receives like a couple thousand letters a month to the national zoo which is why they have to make the zip code for him because they cannot handle the glut of fan mail that he gets and so they start creating these really terrifying looking smoky shaped mailboxes that you can put the letters in. Um, and, uh, and in, in those, and then in also all dimensional depictions of smoky, he is always both pot bellied and insanely jacked. Yeah. Uh, is this, I don't know. Is this where the gay term bear comes from, uh, for a hairy jacked guy with a huge gut could be, I don't know. I'll just leave that to the listener to sort of maybe consider. Um, regardless, uh, definitely those those characteristics describe our good pal Smokey. Which is, yeah. And it, it is kind of, I don't know. I mean, I think it's interesting, like, uh, because he, he ends up being both at once, like both is kind of like Jack, and also this kind of like, oh, dad bod dude. And it's like, it's, so it's, it's interesting that they think those things kind of coexist. Um, well, it's the same thing we were talking about before of you need to be strong and powerful and manly, but you need to be an underdog. So a baby bear who's rescued from a fire, but then becomes, you know, strong and manly and a forest ranger, but is still, still needs our help and is still soft enough to be approachable and cuddly, right? This is, this is how they, from a branding perspective, from an illustrative perspective, walk that very fine line of powerful, nevertheless underdog. 
Yeah. Um, and it's which I find yeah, powerful, really approachable kind of thing, which is like a cool, yeah. anyway, it's a whole fascinating, like a, it's our a, brand. Powerful, approachable is definitely what you and I, yeah, you know, that's just so, how it is. You know, yeah, be. exactly. Don't be scared. Yeah. Don't be scared. You know, I'm like, I'm approachable. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm very mighty, you know, lots of brawn, <laughs> but, uh, but it's just how it is. Okay. It's how I, it's how I am. Well, um, I mean, you've had that beard since you were a child watching uh, McGruff, the crime dog, watching McGruff, uh, uh, whom I thought was, uh, he told me that he was a crime fighting dog. It turned out that he was helping me, that he was making me help himself crack all the whole time <laughs> i always wonder what those bags were anyway um so uh but people get so into smoky bear it's like bizarre right so um so for instance uh the smoky bear facebook page which of course exists has a photograph of um a couple who met at a fire prevention poster contest Oh, sick. And eventually got married. And Smokey Bear was an invited, accepted guest in attendance. Holy crap. Really? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Smokey Bear was at their wedding. I mean, if like. If I knew this was possible, my Jess and I would have invited Smokey to the wedding. You yeah. know this. Yes. Yes, I know, buddy. But, uh, but, but somebody did it already. Uh, and had like, had like a Smokey Bear in their wedding that's incredible also like just making sure that everything does come full circle um smoky of course um i makes guest appearances in the macy's day parade um yes he's one of the central kind of again you know this idea of sort of the the um, liminal space between patriotism, religion, and capitalism that is so often represented by these shamanistic characters, uh, and most especially represented in the Thanksgiving Day Parade with, you know, you definitely have Santa Claus. Sometimes you have the three wise men. Question mark. Uh, Smokey is there. The, this weird Tom Turkey character is there. Like, there are all these creatures that make up this weird spiritual middle space um, that, that, I think their high holy day, their Easter vigil is definitely Thanksgiving. Um, but can we, so we're talking a lot about the aesthetics here. Can we talk about you? I think you were sort of trying to get at this when you mentioned a few minutes ago, how much Smokey uh, transcended and in fact went against what his creators were sort of hoping would happen with him. Can we talk about how ultimately really ineffective Smokey is despite how beloved he is and in fact how ineffective all these characters are? Because that I find a really compelling thing. I, I want you to, um, I just sent you via text a video that I'm going to patch into the main, uh, the main podcast. Um, or Kyle is going to patch in the main podcast. Thank you to producer and engineer Kyle. Could you watch that video right now for us, Father Gabriel, oh, so we can get your live reaction? I already know what it is, and it's amazing. Oh, you do? I do. So this shit is incredible. Um, let's just give you guys a second to watch it right now. Right? Was that not the most disturbing crap you've ever seen in your life? Joanna Cassidy just straight up pulling her face off and this huge imposing bear is underneath. I'm you a bear. You should you listen to me. You Would you have listened if you knew it was me? Like, so yes, creepy. You would have yeah. eaten me, you you're terrifying a bear, thing. Senor. <laughs> Freaking bear, dude. So this is the thing is like, People loved, and in fact, per your examples, love Smokey. People ironically like McGruff. <laughs> People really love McGruff. But what Smokey and McGruff have in common is that they represented a very particular perspective on a social problem and, and took on the best of that perspective, mainly in both characters, their idealism, the idealism of kind of the dare approach to battling drugs in this country, the idealism of post-war, you know, let's return to nature ism. Um, but they also brought with them the, the downfalls of those respective worldviews. Um, as you already said, McGruff in any place where dare happened. Um, and again, McGruff and dare are not, fundamentally connected but they are spiritually connected any place where where dare happened drugs you know statistically went out the wazoo i mean they're just just 
off the Richter scale levels. Um, Smoky Bear had a really problematic effect on forest fires. Um, Well, at the beginning, for the first while, forest fires do drop really dramatically for for the first like decade or two. And then that becomes a problem because well you mentioned right. you mentioned this idea that people are kind of expanding out westward ret- westward ex- uh, returning to nature uh camping and all this and they observe these forest fires and you're right um some of the forest fires they were observing were definitely caused by man um but some of those forest fires were only being observed because it was the first time man had been around to observe them mm-hmm. or at least white man, uh, because what various indigenous cultures and first nation cultures have been observing for thousands of years before we showed up was that forest fires are actually a super important part of nature's cycle. It burns off lower brush and, um, you know, dead leaves and creates room for newer and richer and healthier growth. This is not to, you know, anthropomorphize nature any more than we already have by doing an entire episode dedicated to Smokey Bear, but this is sort of nature's way of self-policing. Um a very circle Wait, of life. You saying, are you shit. saying are you saying that forest fires are nature's McGruff the crime fighting dog? I am saying that. Yeah, I'm <laughs> saying exactly that. And the problem that arises is that people do such a good job of preventing forest fires that the forest fires that do happen are catastrophic posthumously worse yes, yeah catastrophic yeah and this is still a problem we're seeing in california today um you know and, and along the west coast where a lot of those more antiquated ideas of what it means to be eco-friendly still kind of have a, a chokehold um you know we've we've learned like hey there are such a thing as good fires. Um, and, and in fact, Smokey has since be been rebranded in any of his media to explain the difference between good fires and bad fires. Um, and we have to prevent bad fires and he's much more educational. And this is why we have this new slogan. It's not only you can prevent forest fires. It's not only you can keep forests green because we have, we have fundamentally changed our tune. We are trying to present. Uh, we <laughs> Smokey is trying to present a new, it's the Royal. We, you know, we're all smoky. We, we yeah, again the, the, the real the real smoky was the smoke we, we made along the way right yeah and and um you know changing kind of the tune to be a much more nuanced view of forest fires but people get in on this message so hard that it does end up directly contributing to some of the more devastating forest fires that we've seen as a nation yeah um, in just the same way that drug education from guys like McGruff didn't actually help it. It just made kids a lot smarter in terms of finding where the drugs were in their local area and their zip code, you know? So that's also kind of a fascinating thing is like sometimes a campaign like this can be too effective and can very much pinpoint what the problem was in your worldview before you were ever conscious of it. Yeah, like because the problem is, uh, I, like <clears throat> Smokey, Smokey has worked. I mean, the, he's. I mean, Smokey is a like he's an advertising and de- design phenomenon because um, he has been around now for like almost eighty years. Still, like beloved, he survived the horrifying and predictable late nineties swing into cheap government sponsored computer animation mm-hmm. <clears throat> and if he could if he could survive his horrifying five years of computer of, of, of like weird scary computer animation um and still like emerge from it alive um it seems like he's still going you know he has worked so to speak um been popular been grabbed onto been like I- an effective messenger when and i mean literally the only thing he says is variations on only you can prevent forest fires um he in like the 70s and 80s and 90s um got sort of appropriated or they they, again it was classic kind of like 90s this is again guy speaking from eastern washington in the 80s and 90s uh i know exactly what the kind of enthusiastic environmentalism of those time of that period was like um roped smoky into like everything so like 
um, all sure, kinds of yeah. conservation efforts, you know, um, conserving water and wildlife and all these kinds of things. And it watered down the brand and people stopped caring because like, what does the bear have to say about like, um, what like, does the bear say? Oh, 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 water rights. <laughs> you know, like what does the bear have to say about water rights? You know, and like all these kinds right, of things. It's like right. nothing. Um, uh, and so basically they just could, they, as like, as long as they looped it back to, <clears throat> this is what they did in 2001 is they changed the slogan officially from for forest fires to wildfires, right? Trying to do these kinds of things. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I do kind of wonder, um, like the point is well taken again, like Eastern Washington is heavily forested and uh, just on the other side of a desert. So uh, a lot of it burns down every year. Uh, so I'm well aware of the problem of like bad foresting policies and bad laws and stuff and uh, and some bad social practices that lead to like mega fires where only a, a small fire needed to be. Um, but uh, but I do kind of wonder if if this is like resolutely stuck to like will Smokey survive it as a, as in this kind of totemic way, like, which is to say like, can, let me put it this way. Like, can Smokey actually survive outlasting the usefulness of the single, sim- single one sentence simplistic idea he was invented to propose? I mean, I think in so far as Americana nostalgia survives, he won't be a necessary part of it. Um, I think he's just too cemented culturally now to necessarily. I mean, he he's already survived his usefulness, right? He already. I has. guess that's true. I mean, like after about ten years in, he had survived his youthful, youthful youth usefulness. You got this. Don't hurt yourself, kid. But here's so. Here's the more interesting thing that I want to, well, uh, I guess I shouldn't say it's more interesting. That's very hubristic of me to say, I apologize. But here's the thing that is interesting to me that I would really love your feedback on. Because this ultimately, end of the day, is an arts podcast. Um, we, we use that term very, very liberally. Um, but it is ultimately an arts podcast. And there is a component to these mascots, uh, particularly to Smokey and McGruff, that I think you are uniquely qualified to speak on as a Catholic priest with a purview towards the arts, which is these characters are profoundly moralistic. Mm -hmm. You know, you say that, that he only has kind of the only you can prevent forest fires. And, and of course, McGrath's version of that is take a bite out of crime, um, which I didn't realize meant like get that mouth all full of crime <laughs> and then swallow it down so you can like, become a crime creation. As much as I love Smokey and I do, I did. It is it is propaganda for sure, and it is hyper moralistic, kind of oh, appallingly yeah. shaming. Oh uh, yeah, propaganda at that. I mean, touring the museum, you see these. I mean, really beautifully rendered examples. Of just extremely shaming kind of post-war that that 50s hyper repressed wasp Christianity type thing where I mean I, I just sent you an image um, and we'll throw it up now of of Smokey actually praying presumably to the Christian God saying and and please let please make them be careful amen right and and you'll see you know burning forests and and smoky weeping and just looking at the camera and saying you caused this and just like yeah really, it's like a really real shame sh- it's amazing yeah 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 it's a shame campaign i mean it, like, yeah it is yeah and and that is contra because most shame campaigns don't work i mean famously most human societies will will sit with a shame campaign for like 10 ish years. Right. And then they will rebel against it. Hardcore. I mean, this most religions see some version of this. Most political parties see some versions of this. I mean, hell in our, in our last episode on state sponsored media, you know, you talked a little bit about the French revolution and like the ultimate reason the French revolution sort of implodes on itself, or at least one of the reasons it becomes the, the prolapsed asshole that it becomes is, is because people can't stand this. I can't, can't ultimately maintain a zeitgeist of shame for that long a period without just imploding like a black hole. Um, And the reason I'm interested in your thoughts on this is because like, this is stereotypically, of course, the big criticism of 
not just religion, but particularly Christian religion and stereotypically Catholicism, especially is like the hyper emphasis on, on shame in mm. terms of moral instruction. Objectively, shame actually doesn't work very well in, in, in terms of, in just in terms of long-term polemics and, and the ability to maintain a message with Smokey being kind of the outlier. And so I'm just wondering, I mean, without turning this into a whole episode on, on shame, I would just love your kind of knee jerk thoughts on, I mean, maybe you would, maybe it's more nuanced than this, but I would just love your thoughts on, on the, the pros and cons of, of shame as a, as a message delivery device. Um, the Catholic viewpoint on that, why maybe you think Smokey is an exception to that, why he's worked anyway. Um, yeah, again, I just think you're uniquely qualified to, to, to talk about that. And I'm, I'm just, I know I'm putting in the spot, but I'm just personally very interested to hear what your, your hot take would be. Mr. Pope, what can you tell us about Smokey Bear? <laughs> what is the Catholic take on Smokey Bear? Yeah, seriously. Well, uh, that's, <laughs> no, that's awesome. And I think, um, so yeah. One thing that you see really quickly when you look through like the 40s and 50s, especially the ca the catalog of Smokey Bear uh, posters and and advertising stuff in the 40s and 50s, especially, although some I think a little bit into the 60s too, but mostly before, is that Smokey is profoundly religious and that Smokey's religion is terrifying. Um, so yeah. there are, there are a lot of posters of Smokey praying, smoking, Smokey like um, offering these like frantic pleading. Um, passive aggressive prayers um to god but so that somebody else will hear them which is it's passive aggression it's cool not what right. to worry I mean, it's about. literally it's literally the pharisaical prayer from the gospels where like like yeah, yeah, yeah. bear is entering the temple and saying thank you yes, thank you god Yahweh, that i do not start not forest like, fires that i am not like the forest fire starter yes. who is so sinful yeah I mean, it's really i mean it's it's the most toxic version of religion it's like super possible. toxic and um and and you can see like some of the uh like the saccharineness of of this sort of like public presentation of uh of a christianity that frankly is a very unattractive notion of what christianity is i mean i think in the end like even just in the in these posters you do get this strong sense of like oh wow that's why like everyone that's why like a basic cultural reaction to, to like the word christianity just think like oh just a bunch of like kind of moralistic things about do this don't do that and like people you're supposed to make you're supposed to feel bad all the time you know mm -hmm. it's like well because um if Smokey is a totem, uh, the kind of worship that he generates is fairly uncompromising and cruel, you know, um, and it looks kind of like uh, a cultural um, uh, wastewater from Christianity, mm -hmm. which it pretty much is. Um, yeah. And... Uh, I think, uh, I mean, I think you see it shifting, right? Like, uh, and you, I think you see the reason, like, this doesn't, this doesn't really work, right? As it just simply from a like a marketing branding perspective, like already by like the eighties and stuff, you're seeing him switching more into like fear based campaigns rather than shame. Um, you know, big scary forest fires and these kinds of things. Um, right. And like, like now, what's hell, hell essentially? Hell, basically hell, yeah. And now that and now that we're in uh, the kind of like um, snowflake era, he's he's very supportive um, and like gives bear hugs. Like you know, he will give bear hugs online and these kinds of things on social media platforms and stuff. Um, because like now we have reached like the complete turnaround. Like Smokey, uh, like shame as a marketing device works so poorly now um or at least for him like he's tapped it out so completely now he's a very supportive loving um fire prevention bear um who will give you bear <laughs> hugs um right. but like again like totemically speaking you're thinking from it from what this means as like a a cultural artifact generated by kind of religious wastewater um he is very interesting because it's all external action like the only way of being justified is by like um absolutely rigid adherence to a specific and, and specifically defined set of uh, exterior action um when one sees that that has failed that somebody else has failed to do it um the only thing to the only way to respond is by like 
um, horror, the beating of the breast, um, absor- ab- absorbing shame by vicariously and then shaming the other. Right. The the tearing of the garment or in this case, the denim jeans, the denim jeans uh, don't keep them on. Actually, it's very important to keep those <laughs> jeans where they are, where they they they, belo- they deserve to belo- stay where they are. And um, uh, and so in the, which is in the end, just a very toxic uh, way of living. And it's a very like gross God, you know, yeah. um, so like Smokey ends up becoming like in the, for for these years, he is actually a fairly unattractive totem of a very unattractive religion um well i will say he is the most attractive i would argue he's the most attractive totem that unattractive a religion could possibly generate and maybe well, right? you know what actually like, that's, that's a fair like point right that's he good is, to put on his he t- is the he is the head. cuddliest branding something that something that satanic a distortion of christianity could possibly muster yeah, like we are sinners in the hands of an angry God, but only you can prevent eternal fires. Right. <laughs> like oh, and, that's so dark. Yeah, and there that's is so kind dark. there is kind of that going on there. And I think, you know, this sort of um I do it myself, like um external um like the only thing God the the, the God is only a God of external behavior and uh, rigidly defined actions that I neither can nor am or ought to investigate or look at as principles or consider as principles, but I have to follow them rigidly and moralistically and literalistically. So, like, I can't ask a question like, is there a good forest fire or a bad forest fire? Just have to stop all fires, um, et cetera. Uh, th- this is this is a very American notion of religion. It's a very American notion of, of uh, Christianity. Um, and I think it's a temptation that sort of like pulls, um, like a, uh, uh, like a riptide, uh, at the heart of like, uh, the American, like religious experience. Like we just want this so badly and we don't want it to suck us out into the sea of like horrifying nightmare zone where it brings us, but we want it so badly. And it's kind of constantly ripping, um, at our feet if we splash in the ocean. And so like. Uh, so as you say, like uh, a kind of fun 1940s post-war, like in mid-war and then post-war um, totemic version of of the wastewater version of this is Smokey Bear. Um, but and yet, like, oh, go ahead. Sorry. You know, but in the end, this is an untenable notion. Is it like an untenable god? Um, and so, like, even in even in the totemic version, that has to uh, be abandoned and shifted. And look, I'm not trying to make you step up on the pulpit and turn this into a religious podcast, but I think in this particular case, it's important because as a designer and as a psychotherapist, I can speak to that kind of toxicity and I can say, look, ultimately it doesn't matter whether it's true or not because it's just completely ineffective, right? Like it it is just shame is observably ineffective as a mode of transmitting a message. It is psychologically proven to be so. And from just like a design branding efficacy standard, it has repeatedly been proven to be so. So I can speak from that angle, but you know, we have listeners all over the spectrum. We have agnostic listeners, atheistic listeners, Muslim listeners. You know, I'm very, very grateful to have such a mixed bag of, of people who tune into this. And, you know, in the cultural imagination, like the kind of religion that Smokey, in however a cuddly way he does so represents is referred to rightly or wrongly as Catholic guilt. I mean, this is the kind of pop culture shorthand for what he represents is Catholic guilt. And I can't speak to that as much as a psychotherapist and an artist. I can only speak to efficacy. You as a priest, you know, you're establishing, Hey, old Smokey was, we are in the hands of a vengeful God. New Smokey is uh, still only you can prevent forest fires, but I'm just going to kind of cuddle you and pretend that you don't have any culpability. And that these sort of represent two sides of, of very toxic versions of religion. And I'm, although we don't have hours for you to be able to break it down, I would love to hear just for the sake of the diversity of, of our listeners and even maybe Catholic listeners who who struggle with this themselves and and who maybe are in a process. I mean, as many of our listeners I know are, cause they've talked to me about them sometimes, you know, in a process of kind of deconstructing the more rigid and toxic uh, versions of faith that they've come from. I, I would love to kind of hear your two cents on 
like what is the healthy and authentic alternative yeah. to this? Yeah. Well, basically, I mean, people will talk about this like shame versus guilt or these kinds of things and whatever, you know, you we can define these words various ways. But like um, if thinking about um, like shame comes from outside, um, it comes because I've been caught in doing something um, or at the most that I've been I have internalized a notion and I've caught myself at it, you know, um, and it can there's nothing to be done about it. It's just there. It's imputed from the outside. Uh, and so, like, that's just it. Like, I am just so the shame person is who shame has, is social. And yeah, it's, ultimately, it's social. And it's and because it's, it's imputed, it's just just there it is. Like, now I'm just the person who wears the A. I'm just the person who has caused a forest fire. And like, there's that will just always be the case. And that's just it. It's just always on my breast. There it is, you know, Um Guilt uh, is an internal reality. It's a it's a characteristic of um, uh, the actual heart, like the 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 heart considered here now, not as like, oh, I love you so much, you know, but as like um, the deep seat of the individual hood, like who I, the deep seat of who I am, you know, like um, is uh, is that like I am actually made for. Um, a life and a life more abundant, you know, like I'm, uh, and that there are things that I can do that like tear away at that life and actually make me smaller and more cramped and less able to love and less free in my own action and less able to respond to love when I see it. Um, and all these things, uh, and that guilt is the, is the like healthy functioning of the heart, um, that recognizes when I have the presence of those things that says like, I have just done something that like makes me less free that like I have developed a habit of something that makes it hard for me to love like X, Y, or Z, you know, yeah, like, or to I, accept or to accept authentic or to love. accept love or whatever. Um, and guilt is, is this healthy reaction of the heart that says that that thing that it recognizes reality says this thing does not belong there and wants to drive it out. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's motivated by, by an actual recognition of the nature of reality and the way in which I have betrayed it. Um, so it's, so something true. Yeah. I, something has gone wrong here. Um, and like, and I have to authentically recognize who is at fault. Um, sometimes there's internalizing other people's guilt, which is important to recognize. Like, I feel bad about this, but I think it through and actually the other person did something wrong and I, I didn't in fact, wow, that's a shock, you know, but that can happen. Or like the other person did something wrong and I wasn't responsible for that. And then it made me feel X, Y, or Z way. And then I started to do wrong things as a result of that. And that's my fault. You know, so like it, mm -hmm. this is an important identification of like where causality lies. And like, again, we're just looking at reality, like who did what, you know, and who does right. what, you know, there's something that's occurring to me too. So, so, so to recap in my own words, I mean, again, so shame is the thing you're describing as toxic here. And it's, it's an internalization of mor morality is only a way to maintain social status. Other people would judge me if they knew. Um, and and it's final. So like this defines who I am now. Um, and I can either accept it and say, great, this is who I am now and kind of become lax morally, or I can um, hate myself and become very judgmental in, in a toxic Christian kind of way and say, and therefore I suck. But either way, there's it's it's internalized toxic social culture and it's there's a finality to it where guilt you're describing is the positive response to that or the or the untwisting of it i guess i would say like the 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 store brand versus the off brand of shame where it's saying hey like i did do this wrong thing that that prevented me from from being able to accept the fullness or pre or present the fullness of love as it was created to be presented um but i but it's not final it doesn't define me and in fact this feeling calls me on to repair it or accept the grace to repair it or to move forward in some way. Is that a fair summation? Yeah, that's fair. Saying? That it's uh it's sort of like the body producing pus when there's an infection. It's like, oh, I don't want to be walking around with a bunch of pus. 
Uh, but if the pu- if the, if the if a person's body is such that like it doesn't produce the pus when there's an infection, that's a very dangerous situation actually because of because of the because oh, yeah. there's no way of recognizing that there's a very serious infection there. You know, um, and so guilt is kind of like that. It's a marker that says like, hey, we got so we got to do something about this. Um, yeah, and so it's yeah. trans it's it's transformative. Like it's it's ordered towards transformation. I can't ultimately, what I need is forgiveness. What I need is a restoration of love. And I can't usually just do that myself. Like it creates relationship and structures relationship. Um, I should point, it points towards love that creates and structures relationship. So like, um, right. I need it ultimately from God and receiving it from God gives me the freedom to receive it from other people, gives me the freedom to give that forgiveness to other people and on and on. Right. See, but like guilt is the, the like, why is it there? Um, not because we love it, not because it's so amazing to be walking around with a bunch of pustules, but um, but because um, the sickest thing is to be dying without knowing it. And, yeah. uh, and oh, the only person who can, somebody can only become healthy if there are signs that they're paying attention to that their body is making that there's something wrong and that they can respond to that and be made whole, be healed. Right. But also if they know that they themselves are not the pus like the pus is there but they are not the pus right yeah, which yeah, is yeah, you know, yeah, where exactly. the toxic religious person comes in and they say oh, no no just i me. am the me. sinner oh. well no there's there's a, there's the self-acceptance version you're talking yeah. about like the false self-acceptance but there's also the hyper scrupulous like oh, oh i yeah. am just terrible i am nothing but pus oh i mean and that yeah, there's wallowing no real the pus. it's so awful it's so right, awful. there's no move towards the divine physician who would seek to heal me of that yeah. it's just kind of miring in my shittiness there's there, I like this point that you're making as far as Smokey goes, though, because this is something I didn't pick up on. But you're talking about how there's an inherently relational component to guilt, where like if I feel healthy guilt, it points me to relationship. It points me to relationship with the person I've hurt or offended, where I go to seek reconciliation with them. It points me towards the relationship with the community, right? Where I seek to be reingratiated into the community by becoming a better version of myself. And it ultimately seeks uh, or, or, or uh, seeks to call me in a greater relationship with, with Christ who can offer that healing and that reconciliation as the physician who is uniquely qualified to, to get rid of the pus. Shame is, I would assume in contrast to that inherently isolating, right? Yeah. It, 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 it isolates me. It says, I'm so terrible. No one can find out how terrible I am. I must necessarily isolate out from people, from the person I've hurt. Um, you know, if I like classically, right. If I've cheated on my wife, like I can't tell her cause I'm so ashamed, you know, like it's actually making the infection worse by isolating me. And it's also ultimately, ultimately causing me to, to isolate from God as we see like, you know, Adam and Eve hiding their sin from God as opposed to seeking him out or, or Judas, you know, committing suicide rather than face Christ, you know, and, and maybe this is too heavy to say, but as you're describing that juxtaposition of like shame versus guilt, isolation versus relationship, isn't it so funny that Smokey the bear or Smokey bear as this totem of shameful religion says only you. Only you oh, can prevent yeah. forest fires. Like there is, an iso- you there is an isolative quality to that. Yeah. Right. Like right off the bat, it's not, Hey, join with the community, you know, do you know, let, let's all do our part together. You know, let, there's, there's nothing, there's none of that in this antiquated version of Smokey. It, it is this isolative, you have this burden of responsibility here and you better do your job, you know? And I think that's so interesting. Like I'm going to actually, I might use Smokey to explain shame to my clients from now on. Cause like, <laughs> or at least the difference between shame and guilt. Cause what a perfect microcosm of that. That is, huh? I'm going to be thinking about that for a long time now. That's why Smokey doesn't have friends. <laughs> other than, other than Bambi, you know, other than but, Bambi. That's a whole other story. Well, you know, this, this to me creates, I always like to end these episodes on an artistic prompt. Right. And, and in my mind, this creates a construct for a very interesting artistic prompt. You know, there are many people who listen to this podcast, perhaps who are trying to illustrate kids books who are, 
ha, you know, have opportunities to create characters of their own, let's say, whether that's for a movie or an advertising campaign or a children's book or whatever you have the, they're, they're facing the opportunity, the potential to create their own, their own totemic shamanistic mascot, as it were their own smoky. And we've seen how successful that can be. We've also seen how toxic that can be. If you're not sure of, of your message, when you start out, if, if you're willing to kind of sell your soul as it were to, to shame or to blind self-acceptance rather than to healthy and relational guilt in the face of, you know, actual social issue. So maybe this is the, the call that you're looking for to kind of put some guidelines on yourself to make sure that you're presenting that healthy, positive character, um, that isn't falling into some of the more toxic elements that, Smokey and his even less fortunate brother McGruff have historically fallen into, but whatever you're making, whatever you're designing, even if it's just your own life, uh, we wish blessings upon you uh, because only you can go forth and create cool things. You've been listening to Creator Things, a podcast of Catholic creatives, hosted by Father Gabriel Toretta OP and Jacob Flores Popcheck, produced by Jessica Flores Popcheck and Kyle Meineke. To find out more about how you can support the podcast and other ventures for artists, visit catholiccreatives.org forward slash support. 